Okay, there we go. Everything gets bumped. Anyway, what's up, everyone? Welcome to another episode of the What's Up webcast. We do this every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here at the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. We cover everything from what's up in the nighttime sky to equipment to helpful tips and tricks. And, of course, at the end of the month, we have a special guest to talk about their specialty in the field of astronomy. Um, so... We are back uh, from the eclipse. I hope you had a great time. I know the weather was a bit lackluster um, for many of us. Uh, we lucked out incredibly at the Texas Star Party eclipse event. It wasn't looking great to start with, and it ended up working just fine. Uh, but yeah, storms were definitely an issue down in Texas. Um, so hopefully a lot of you got a chance to see some portion of the eclipse that happened on Monday. It was awesome. And if not, I guess you're going to Spain in 2026 um, or you're waiting like 20 years before another one happens here in uh, the U.S. So I um, hope you had a good time. Hope you got home safe and uh, welcome back. Uh, this week is a live episode, but next week will be recorded again because we are heading off to NIAC and NEF. Um, so if you're going to be there at those events next week, uh, week. We hope to see you there. We've got some new stuff we're going to be announcing. We've kept this very quiet um, and under wraps. I still can't tell you about it, but we're about a week away before you get to see it. Um, so we're pretty stoked about that. So keep an eye on the website and social media, and I'm sure it'll end up on the forum websites like Cloudy Nights as well. Um, but yeah, so that's that. It's also our 200th episode today. Um, we wanted to do more for the 200th episode, but this month is just so incredibly ridiculous between the uh, Texas Star Party event we went to, we're home for six days, and we go to NEAC and NEF. So April is a whirlwind. So we weren't able to sit and actually do... Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, it's a really busy week or month at this point. So... Um, we wanted to do more for the 200th episode, which is today, but we'll try to make up for it in the future. So thank all of you for who have watched the whole time um, and who've been a part of it. I definitely appreciate it. Um, a few things before we get started, just the normal, you know, chitty chat kind of stuff. Um, if you want to support the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. It lets us know we're doing a good job. Um, if you want to support the channel even more, you can go to skywatcher.threadless.com. Um, so head over there and we uh, have all kinds of cool stuff going there and all that cool stuff. Uh, still no patch. The, if you don't have your patch, then you need to email uh, info at skywatchusa.com and we'll get that squared away for you um, or totem at skywatchusa.com. We shipped everything that we had on record. So if we missed one, please email us at totem at skywatchusa.com and we will get that corrected for you. So we thought we cleared everyone. Um, we do have the 25th anniversary scope available as well. Uh, I think we're sold out through us, but you can go to your favorite dealer and check it out. But there are more coming. So if you're waiting, it won't be, we'll have some in the summer, uh, but there should be some uh, dealers out there that have these in stock. Um, there's only a thousand of these worldwide. So go ahead and pick yours up because when they're gone, they're gone. And that's it. They're all individually serialized, and it's a pretty cool little setup. Um, uh, what am I missing out on? What are these patches? Uh, so if you don't know about the totem patches, totem is target of the month, which if you go to skywatchusa.com, media, target of the month, we give you a target to shoot every month. And if you get it and you send it in, um, you get a patch. So this was the 2022 patch, the 23 patch, and now our 2024 patch. Um, and this is what you get. Um, and then if, uh, for new this year for Totem, all the images will go into uh, our files. We'll look through them. We'll pick the best one from each month. And then the top 12 images of the year, so one from each month, will go to our uh, guest judges and... Our first place is $3,000 credit on our website. Second place is $1,000. And third place is $500 towards buying something from the Skywatcher USA website. Um, and you can use those credits to apply um, for that. So pretty neat. Um, so that is target of the month and that's the patch. So hopefully that clears that up. 
All right, so this week we're doing private astronomy events for profit. This is something I do for side uh, money. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about it. I won't give away everything because um, sometimes you just kind of have to figure what's going to work for you as well. Um, like I said earlier, um, please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on the video. It lets us know we're doing a good job. If you want to stay up with what we're doing, um, head over to skywatchusa.com. Go at the top, hit subscribe and save. And that will get you on the email list and we will send emails out letting you know what the um, what's going on at Skywatcher from sales, new product announcements. And then we also have a weekly email that goes out telling you about the uh, webcast episode. So, all right, so let's talk private events. So, um, private events are things like corporate events events, uh, weddings, uh, private parties, things like that. Um, these are events that you get hired by either an event planner or an organizer, whoever's spearheading this event. Um, you can get hired to do these events, bring your equipment out, and you are basically entertainment for these events. Now, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, with a friend of mine um, and now I've got my own side gig going on um, and it's a good way to handle a few different things I know we would all like to make money with astronomy that's a very difficult thing to do um, but this is a probably the most abundant way to do it on your own time and your own dime at that point no pun intended or rhyming or any in there um, but I'm gonna kind of give you the base of how I got started and what you should look for if you wanna do this, and then you can go ahead and apply it uh, in your own ways on how you wanna do it if you want to. But it's nice to get some side money, uh, but there are some caveats that you need to uh, take into consideration. But when I say private events, I normally am doing like corporate retreats, um, team building, um, it's very popular here in Arizona because the weather is usually really nice um, from fall to spring. There's a lot of corporations that come out here and do team building events and usually where stargazing is a activity um, that people like to have out here, at least in the desert. Now, I'm, I am aware that some of you are in locations that might not allow such uh, events because maybe the weather isn't good or whatever. So you kind of have to apply this for where you're going to be, but I'll still give you kind of the basic overview on how to get started doing this and things that you need to consider. Um, now private events, in my opinion, are not outreach events. Um, outreach in my book means you are there to educate. The goal is to educate. You're going to a location to spread the word of astronomy and uh, get people into it. Private events are, you are hired entertainment. So you are there to show them something cool and you are definitely something different. You're not a DJ, you're not a band, you're not a, you know, goat yoga instructor, which I have had in an event before. I did one last night, we had a crystal reader I don't know what that is either, but I'll get to that in a minute. But there are usually other activities at these events, especially the big ones where they're spending a lot of money on this stuff. Um, you are just there as another form of entertainment that's really unique and cool and different. Um, but I don't consider this to be an outreach event. I consider this to be you're just there. So... Um, you are hired entertainment. So that's something that you need to remember if you start doing these. It is a unique and different thing. There's not a lot of events, um, at least whenever we go out, uh, my team and I, whenever we go out and do a gig like this, a lot of people are very surprised that they have stargazing um, as an option, um, especially with the telescopes that we bring out. So um, it's very unique and gets people's attention um, because it's just out of left field. But a lot of times everybody just loves it. Um, everyone generally has an interest in it. So I would say, I guess it could be a form of outreach, but you are not there with the purpose of educating. You're there with the purpose of providing some kind of unique entertainment. Um, so I try to keep them separate in my head. Uh, now there are opportunities that can spearhead from these events. Um, you could meet new people. 
Um, a lot of these events have pretty well-to-do people who are either well-off or they're well-connected. Um, so you never know who you're going to meet. Um, I've had the LA Lakers come through um, before. We didn't do an event for them. We were at a location and they were there. Um, but you just never know who you're going to meet doing these events um, or who the client's even going to be a lot of times. Because for me, when you start doing this, a lot of times you're working with like an event organizer, an event planner, or someone who is the um, main contact for whatever the venue is. You very rarely are working with the, the end client um, at that point. So meeting new people is really cool. Um, you can have tax write-offs on this um, because if you become a business, um, you can buy equipment and you can write that off as a business expense. So there is that as long as you kind of know what you're doing and you pay attention to it. Um, but it's kind of cool to be able to buy a piece of equipment and just write it off because it's for work. Um, and then, of course, there is side money, which, you know, in this day and age is actually really nice to have. So um, I wouldn't say you're making a mint on it. I have some friends that do this full time um, and they are booked almost every night. They make very good money doing it, but it's a big commitment. And I wouldn't recommend doing this full time unless you've really got the ball rolling and it's covering your living expenses. Um, for me, I'm not doing that full time. It's just a little side gig and it comes here and there. And Skywatcher is the full time job and all the benefits from that are great. Um, so this is just side money um, when it can come across. So let's talk about costs because you don't just get your telescope and immediately run out and start doing this. There are some things that you need to consider before you start doing your own events. Um, and these are things that you need to consider because they are going to cost you money up front uh, before you make a dime on any of this stuff. So here's some costs that you're going to need to consider. The big one is insurance. You have to have liability insurance when you are doing this um, at all. Um, a lot of venues will not even have a discussion with you if you do not have liability insurance. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, well, when we go out, uh, we don't worry about that because we have our club. Well, yeah, most organizations are going to have their own liability insurance. Like most astronomy clubs, if you actually ask, they, it's a cost that's on the books and they have insurance um, to cover them. So if you ever go to a school or any kind of event, most legitimate organizations who are doing stuff like that when you actually get down into the nitty-gritty you will find they have some kind of insurance policy and whether you are doing outreach um, at schools or you're doing private events or whatever seriously you need to have that liability insurance and for this day and age um, usually you want at least a two million dollar liability um, insurance that's needed um, that sounds like a ton of money, but that's not what you're paying, but that is the policy that you need to carry. Um, most schools and other venues won't talk to you um, unless you have a $2 million liability insurance um, ready to go. Now, this is roughly going to cost $2,000 a year. It really depends on who you're working with and which insurance company and what you have insured um, that will obviously dictate how much you're going to be doing now this is a business expense so you can write this off on your taxes at the end of the year um, you can usually get by with a couple years uh, by not making any money but by the year three you should probably be making some kind of money um, even after the write-off is already done for the taxes but uh, your insurance policy is going to be probably your biggest investment right off the bat that is not astronomy related at all. So that's something that you absolutely need to have. If, you, if you're if you part of a club and you go out and you've never heard of this before, it's probably because the club already has it. I know uh, NASA Solar System Ambassadors, um, they're backed by NASA, and NASA, I believe, has their own insurance policy for that organization. So there are some advantages here and there. But you have to be careful when you're under some other organization. Um, but yeah, and like the cat made this in the chat, writing something off doesn't mean you automatically get, 
you know, the cost back, you're only getting a portion deducted from it. Um, so there's some tax advantages, but you don't get it all back. So be prepared to pay taxes and you have to be, um, you really need to pay attention to what you're doing if you've never done this before, because you need to keep track of your stuff. Uh, so I like to use QuickBooks or if you're just getting started, a simple Excel sheet can do okay, but QuickBooks is the best way. If not, there are better ways at that point. But as you get bigger, you'll probably want an accountant to manage a lot of this stuff for you. But I'm not big enough to handle all that, so I just use QuickBooks and it does just fine. Um, like I said, I don't do this full time. It's just side gigs. Um, but yeah, be careful with writing things off. There's an advantage to it, but you're not getting the full cost of it back. Um, you want to have, uh, sorry, there's a typo in there. Um, you really need to discuss with the insurance company that's backing you because some insurance companies, if you're like, I'm going to start a stargazing business, they're going to be like, what the heck is that? And a lot of times they'll be like, no, nope, that's not happening. Um, so not all insurance companies are going to provide the liability insurance that you want. So make sure you're doing some research and digging through um, what you're looking for. So it's going to take some kind of homework for you to do it. Um, I've had to dig a lot to learn this as well. And sometimes it's a bit of an uphill battle. Mindset. So this is a really big one. Um, and when I was putting this together, whoops, uh, when I was putting this whole thing together, uh, this kind of came to me midway that this is something that could actually be applied to outreach as well. But you need to have a certain mindset when you're doing these kinds of events and outreach is a good second to how this should be done. And the biggest thing I will say, cause I have done a lot of these, I've done a lot of outreach events. The single biggest issue I've had with people who are just getting into this is you are not here for you. You are not there at this event to do your own observing and to sit there and chat with your friends and be antisocial. I have seen it over and over and I'm not saying that everyone's this way. There's a lot of great people out there, but I have seen it numerous times at events where you're just not welcoming or people don't know. And I know a lot of us are introverts, so that's hard for us to do. That's why we probably chose astronomy. But um, you need to remember that it's, especially when you're doing a private event um, and you are getting paid, you are there on someone else's time and someone else's money. So you are not there to observe for yourself. Um, so number one, you need to be welcoming. Um, always invite people up to the telescope, welcome them, inform them what you're looking at. Um, you want to be informative to people. You want to be personal to people and just make them feel like they are welcome around the equipment. Now you need to remember the good portion of people at these events and even outreach events have never used a telescope before. And I have seen people get really testy with attendees that, you know, they touch the telescope, they do this and, you know, don't touch that. Uh, you can't go that route with this, um, especially if you want to be successful doing this, because if you're difficult to work with in any way, or if you cannot communicate with people in a clear way and professional way, you will not get any more business after that. They will write you off and they will go on to find something else. But if you're personable to people and welcoming and informative and you're able to talk to people on a level they understand, which is another one, do not talk over your client's head. Now, I know a lot of us know way more about astronomy than most people do. That's great. And it can be very easy to talk over people or talk down to people because they just don't know. So with these events, you need to talk at a level that the general public can understand. If you're good at outreach, you'll be good at private events as well. People are curious. And if people don't know, you are there. You're the astronomer. You should be the one to inform them that, hey, 
you don't want to touch the telescope because it's tracking and we're following an object and you can be very cordial about it. You don't have to be, you know, abrasive. So be very careful that you're not abrasive during these events. Um, because if you are and it gets back to, because a lot of times at the end of these events, the event planners and such will, will find out from the clients how things went. And if they hear back that, oh, this person was really abrasive and it wasn't welcoming, you will never get another job again. And event planners talk to each other a lot. So you can either have a really good time and you'll get callbacks or if you're abrasive and, you know, egotistical and difficult to work with, no one's going to want to work with you and you're done. So you don't have a big window to make that impression. So, but yeah, just be professional and kind. Um, you want to dress professionally um, with these events. They are paying you um, and your time is worth something as well. So you need to be professional. Um, always present professionally, you know, arrive early or be on time, you know, be communicative, uh, communicate with your client clearly. You are the astronomer. They want your input just as much as anybody else. You don't want to be difficult to work with, uh, but you don't, you want to be informative. So if you get to a location, it's like, hey, uh, we noticed that where we're setting up has some trees and there's some lights overhanging the area, but we noticed just over here would work better. Are you okay with that? And a lot of times the planners will be perfectly fine with that as long as it doesn't interrupt with some other thing at these events. Um, every interaction should be professional all the time, whether it's email or phone call of all the prep getting up to it, to where you're there, you need to be professional all the time. Um, branding is important as well. Um, I have jackets and shirts, uh, that have my brands on them. Um, it just makes you look legitimate. Now I wouldn't say that's something that you would need to do right off the bat. That's something you can build into, but at the very least dress professionally, which are, I like black boots, pants, and shirt, um, have a jacket, you know, maybe, um, just dress as professionally as possible, especially if you're just starting out, you know, you're new, you probably haven't gotten your branding done. Um, but have some business cards cause people are going to want to have a social media built, have a website built. Even if it's just getting started, at least have some kind of foundation. So you look as professional as possible. Um, I wouldn't say fake it till you make it kind of thing, but do as much as you can to make it look like you are as legitimate as possible if you're starting out. Um, eventually it will evolve to where you have more and more events under your belt and you'll have more in your portfolio. So when people call and ask or email you being like, hey, we wanna do this, what can you show me? They can go to your social media for, and see how your events are done, uh, your website or anything like that. But try to build that foundation as best you can before you get started. So it makes it look like you've been doing this for a while. Um, but you need to dress professionally. Don't dress like you're just hanging out with the club and going out and doing some, you know, dark sky observing thing. Um, I have seen numerous people show up where they're just, their shirts are worn and faded and stuff like that. And there's a time and a place for all of that. Um, but when you are getting paid, to do an event, you need to look the part too. So you need to look polished, not like crazy high end, but look, you know, business casual is the best way I could approach that. But it's important that you look the part, especially when people are paying you. Um, again, you are not there to observe for you. Um, you cannot be complaining about lighting. Uh, I have had this happen a lot too. Um, you can see from the event here in the pictures, we have a clear area and there are some strung lights across there. And I know people who would flip out being like, if there's just too much light, we can't do anything. That's not an option when you're doing stuff like this. Um, a lot of these locations are generally at resorts. They were never intended to have telescopes set up. There's no thought about telescopes there at all. 
And a lot of these places are difficult to load your gear into. Again, they were not thought out to make it easy for us to get big telescopes into them. So you want to make sure you have a really good understanding of the venue that you're setting up in, where you need to get your gear to. You might have to invest in some other equipment to help with that, and we'll talk about that here soon. But you will find out that a lot of these locations, they have trees, they have lights. It is not ideal. You are not in some dark sky site. And you got to get over it because you just have to pick targets that are easy for people to see. And it doesn't take much to wow the crowd with it, especially when you're bringing a decent little telescope. Um, you know, the moon goes a long way. If there are planets up, even better. You know, if you're doing deep sky stuff, maybe have a couple binary stars like Alberio or Mizar. Those are great ones to have. We're talking very basic targets. We're not here to show people the, you know, um, the Veil Nebula. It's great if you're at a site that you can do that, but nine times out of ten, you're not going to be in a, a great location. So stick to the very, very basics. Just something to wow the crowd um, because... The bar sits pretty low because a lot of people have never even looked through a telescope before. So, you know, I try to pick events. If I have the ability to assist with picking a date, uh, I try to find times when the moon is up. I try to find times when there's some planets up. And if there's not, you know, you just got to work with it. I've done events where there's nothing and it's galaxy season and it's really difficult. But you just have to pick stuff and do your best because it all comes down to when they want it. You are not there to observe for yourself. And if light pollution bugs you, and if not observing in a site that's ideal bugs you, this is not the line of work for you. There are times and places where you can go do that. That's fine. This is not it. Uh, clients. Um, a lot of times... For me, at least, I work with event planners. I'll get an email or a call from an event planner, um, either someone I've worked with before or maybe they heard from another person I've worked with. And if you start, you know, having a good reputation, event planners pass that off to other planners that they know. And that's how you get more business. Now, that you can also do resorts. I like working with resorts and their planners, too, because then you're just something very special for them. I do have some friends of mine who do this who have contracts with resorts sp specifically for them. They are their astronomer on site. Those are really sweet gigs because then you are basically on a contract with a resort and you come whenever the contract says, like maybe you're there every week. I know some of my friends are there every week. Maybe you're there once a month. Whatever the case may be, uh, resorts um, are the best ones, I think, to work with. Um, you do have special event organizers. Um, usually, that's kind of a rarity. Uh, that's usually a, a, like a company that's coming in and they've just given one person who works for the company, the they're the spearhead and the communications for this event, but you're not dealing with an actual event planner. Um, so... Yeah, I like event planners, um, and when you start doing this as much as I do, there's probably about a dozen or so, maybe more, event planners that you work with, and that's where all your business kind of comes from, is they're the ones that are out selling you, and you're just an experience in their toolbox of various things they can hand over to the client. Uh, resorts are cool as well, uh, special event organizers, and then you have individuals, um, I will tell you up front, I don't work with individuals anymore. Um, an individual is just someone like anybody who's like, hey, I found your information and I'd like you to come to my house to do this special event. Um, I don't like doing that for individuals. Um, and for the way I have it set up, my pricing is set high enough to where it kind of filters that out. But the reason I don't like working with individuals is because they don't really have a firm grasp on what they're actually asking for, and they also don't like the price. Um, again, I'm used to working with corporate events, so the price is set higher to reflect upon that, but I have done enough 
free events and I've done enough uh, for individuals to where I feel like I've gotten out of that. It just turns out to be more of a headache because they don't ha a lot of times someone who's just doing like some backyard party and they just want stargazing. It's not well thought out. It's not well organized. Um, it can just be really messy to work with. And I really do not like working on someone else's property. Um, a resort is different. It's a big public property. There's always people there. I don't feel comfortable going to people's houses. I just feel like things are different when you're on someone else's home. Um, there's just a very few handful of people that I've worked with that I will do something private for them. Um, but if it's just some random person calling me up, I appreciate them, but I don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, on someone else's house. That's just my rule. You could do it with someone else um, or any way you want to do it. That's the cool thing about this is there's not really any kind of manual for this kind of business. You just do it the way you want to do it. Uh, let's do planning. So actually there's some questions here really quick. Looking forward to the equipment portion. We'll get to that. That's coming up um, with galaxy season approaching. Any suggestions on how I can view galaxies from a Bortle 6? Um, galaxy season, you probably want 150 millimeter or six inch or bigger, ideally, um, filters, you could use a light pollution filter, but it doesn't do much. Um, eyepieces, really anything kind of works It all. Eyepieces are all going to come down to what scope you're using. So it's not a one size fits all, but in galaxy season, aperture is king. That's, that's the end of it. Uh, Neef is almost coming up. Will there be waterproof APO released by Skywatcher? No. Um, we have nothing for waterproof stuff. Um, that's a spotting scope. So, uh, let's see. Yes. So I think we got all of that. Okay. So planning. Um, first off, you need to know your client. You need to listen to their needs and their wants. Again, you need to remember you are not here for you. You are there for them. They are paying for your time to be here. So you need to listen to what they need. Listen to how many people are going to be. You need, And you need to ask questions. So they want your input because they do not know likely do not know anything about astronomy. They think you're really cool. They think what you offer is really neat. That's the reason they reached out to you. But you need to be professional and polite, but you need to also inform them on the best way to get this done so they can have a good event and their client can have a good event. So things I ask are how many guests? What's the location going to be? Like where you know, okay, we, we're doing it at a resort. Where in the resort are we setting up? And if it looks, I'll look it up on Google Earth and be like, can you give me a map for this location? And I'll look it up on Google Earth. And if it looks too clustered, I might say this looks a little bit difficult. Maybe we can move it somewhere else where the telescopes have better visibility or whatever the case may be. But don't be afraid to give your input, but always be polite and always give a reason as to why. Because if they see you are just trying to make their event even better and honestly make their money go further and get as much out of as possible, they appreciate that, that you're looking out for what they're trying to do and you want their event to be as successful as possible. So how many guests? For me, my usual rule is about 50 people per telescope. That way you're not having tons of lines. Um, because on big events, you're going to have lines. Um, usually with stuff like this, there's not lines too much because there's other things for people to do. But it's something to ask. You might need to bring another telescope or two, depending on how big the group. But on average, I figure about 50 people. You can ask about what else is going on at the event, what other activities there are. So you can kind of help gauge how busy you might be. Again, location, look up on Google Earth, all of that fun stuff. Uh, when ask them when the date is, maybe they don't quite have a date picked out. And that's actually something that can be helpful if they're like, well, what would you recommend? Uh, and what I would do if they give me like some windows of like, well, we want something around this time frame. I'll go on sky safari and be like, well, I would pick this evening because we have a moon up and we have some planets up and this would make it really great for your 
people, your attendees would have a really good time when we have this up in the sky. And even if they pitch me a date or if it's like, well, we want it on this date, I will still go into Sky Safari and be like, that looks pretty good. Here are some things that you can expect to see that night. And when you're proactive like that, it shows that you're invested in it and that you're willing to work with them and make their event as best as possible. And people appreciate that when you do that right off the bat. Uh, venues, uh, you want to learn the venue layout. Um, I did a resort last night here in Phoenix, and the setup area was way in the back. Um, and you had to take a path and lug all your stuff in there. Uh, it's a trek, and a lot of these locations are not ideal to trek in these kinds of telescopes, and you want your equipment to be ready to handle any of that. Um, but make sure you ask for like a map. If you're not familiar with the location, ask for a map on, hey, where's the setup spot? Where do I park our vehicles? Can I leave my vehicles there the entire time, or do I have to move it? The best ones are when you can pull right out of your truck and load right in next to it. That never works for most resorts. Most resorts, you're pulling your gear, so you need to make sure you're ready to do that. But you need to learn the venue layout. Uh, you want to know the setup area and make sure where you're going to be, how much space you're going to be. Most telescopes, I would tell someone on average is about a 10 foot square or 10 foot circle is the operating space for that. So if you don't have the ability to go to a venue, go just tell them that. If you've never been to a venue and you have plenty of time to go meet with the event planner and kind of scope it out, that's even better because then you can work with them. It also lets you meet them in person beforehand. They can have that personal connection with you. You know each other now. So when the date of the event comes, you're already, you've met each other face to face. You're willing to work with each other at that point. Um, but setup area, I figure about 10 feet per scope. Now I have a 28 inch daub that I do bring out to certain events and I used to do this with a 20 inch daub. Um, they work perfectly fine as long as you are willing to trek that gear back in there and you know the space. So my 28, I usually tell people we need a 20 foot operating circle for that. And sometimes they're really excited because it's a very unique experience to have a telescope that big out there. And that can give you a level up too. If you have a larger piece of gear that you bring out compared to anybody else doing it, that ups the level a bit. And then you're more interesting. It just gives you another selling point and you might be able to command a larger uh, price for your time and effort when you've got unique stuff. Uh, bring supporting gear. Now, what do I mean by supporting gear? Lights wagon etc now everyone's probably freaking out they're like why would you bring lights i don't mean white lights i during the christmas time went to target and bought several strands of red led christmas lights and i have those all they're like 300 feet of them and they are wound up on like a extension cord reel and that is something that we offer it's like we have astronomy accent lighting to go around and light certain areas for safety um, there when you have stuff like that that perks up people's ears because they're like wow you've thought about this uh, things they don't think about so you know we have lights we have step ladders for people's security we have glow tape on counterweights and trip areas we've taken the time to learn where the safety issues might occur in the dark you're dealing with people who've probably never touched a telescope before so you need to make sure you've got that all prepped so you can let people know that hey we've got all this there but still remember that you are not here to do deep sky observing you are not here to observe from yourself and there's a good chance that the location you're in is trash for astronomy but you are still getting hired and you still have to make it work so having supporting equipment like lights and stuff like that, a good wagon is a massive investment. Uh, I went to Harbor Freight and I have a big green um, wire mesh wagon for uh, like gardening. It's got big inflatable tires 
and I'm able to lug my entire seven inch triplet setup on that one cart. And that makes it really easy so I don't have to go back and forth to the car lugging things around. I can lug everything on that one wagon and it's got big tires so I can get through loose gravel and I can get through all this weird terrain and it works fine. And then it keeps everything nice and contained. So a wagon is a really good thing for you to have or some kind of cart um, is very helpful to lug your gear and get things in and out more timely and that makes it easier on you when you're having to lug all this stuff around. Now, that's also gonna be dictated by what kind of gear you're working with. I have stuff that supports the equipment that I have chosen to use. You need to do the same. Uh, let's see, be wary of event planners who think that astronomy equals astrology or think they're people that show up, they star registered for their guests. Um, yeah, so this is something about astrology you're gonna get asked about it. You just have to deal with it. How you choose to deal with that will kind of dictate how things are going. This is one of those where I don't believe in astrology. You can be informative. People like to see their constellation. You don't have to abide by the rules of astrology or anything like that or even believe it. But again, remember, you're there to entertain. So the way I'll do it is someone's like, oh, I'm a Leo. Cool. Just so happens that Leo is up this evening. Let me point it out with the laser pointer, which is a massive thing to have. Get a good laser pointer. People like that. So you don't have to go along with it, but who cares? They're not getting paid for your opinion. You're getting paid to be there. So you need to entertain. So I'm not being the dancing monkey, but there's a balance between educational entertainment and just being whatever about it so what i will normally do is if someone's like hey i'm into i'm a leo or i'm a gemini or i'm a scorpio whatever it is you can be like oh well on this evening we actually have gemini and they're right up here and here's leo over here but here's some of the other constellations in the sky so doing something like that you didn't blow them off you showed them what they wanted to know there it is you don't have to go into the details about it. And if they ask, like, what, what's your thought on this? You can just be like, you know, I don't really follow it too much. So I don't I don't really know a lot about that. That's OK. But don't disrespect someone either. If they're into it, fine. They're into it. I can think it's trash, but I'm not going to disrespect what they believe. So but you can balance that by being, well, here's your constellation. Oh, you know what? It's not up right now. Scorpio's in the summer months, uh, so it's not visible this evening. It's right about where the sun is right now. And then from there, you can actually segue to pointing out other constellations. So like I said earlier, you gave them a little bit of what they want, but now you're educating them on the rest of the sky and what's up and visible. So you can actually balance that out a bit. Now, if they're a little bit, more wanting to know about that that's where you completely shatter astrology altogether and be like did you know there's actually 13 constellations along the ecliptic line and that actually affects the way astrology is and that's where you can start to educate a little bit more and you kind of break the astrology trend right there while being informative but not disrespectful so it's a delicate balance but when you do this as much as some of us do it's very easy as long as you're being respectful to people um, now i do know there are people here talking about flat earth that's a whole nother conversation there's no room for that at my events it's like yeah that's not how that works or did we land on the moon yes we did there's not a conversation at that point so Certain things, you just kind of have to read the room and go with it. But astrology, it's one of those I kind of let slide because who cares? If that's what they want to go with, just let them go with it. They're not hurting anybody, but it's a fun thing. Now, if they have a star registry, you can have your opinions on that. I have my opinions on that. But you also have to remember that a lot of people who have these registered stars yeah, we all know in the hobby what that actually means. It's like, okay, great, you have a star. To them, it means a lot more. I had an event a few weeks ago before the eclipse I was helping out with. Two people approached us. They had stars. 
they wanted to see him. Only one was up. The other one wasn't. You need to be very careful with these star registry uh, attendees who bring this up because a lot of times if someone has a registered star, there is something personal and connected to that. And if you don't respect them in that point and just let them see something that's around their star, you're disrespecting what that means. It's not so much that I have a star. No, it, it's personal. And the two people that attended the event a few weeks ago, their star registries were named after people that had recently passed away. So that's a very personal thing. It's very special to them. So just go with it. Don't disrespect them. Don't put it down because that's special to them. Would I recommend if someone came up, should I buy a star? Absolutely not. Just don't worry about it. But if they do have one, that has meaning to them. It has something special with them. Just go with them on that. Show them what they want to see. And when they get to see their star, they're totally stoked. And they're so appreciative that you took the time and the effort to show them that. And they know it's there and it's their special thing. And just let them have that moment. And that's it. Go on with the rest of the evening and you're done. So, yeah, there are. this is the things that I'm trying to mention to people where you have to be careful about it. We know in the field of astronomy a lot about this and where the gimmicks are and where things are like, yeah, that's total garbage. But you need to be careful about it. So, so if they want to buy it, let them go buy it. If that's what they want to do with their money, let them go do it. I'm not selling it to you, but I'm happy to show it to you if it's up. That's it. Then I go on with my evening. Equipment. Um, equipment is a big deal. And the funny thing is equipment does and does not matter at the exact same time. Um, clients want something impressive. And a lot of times when they hire you to come out with a telescope, they think you're going to come out with something from like Costco or Walmart, some dinky thing, because they've never seen telescopes like the majority of what we have. Um, most of us have a very nice telescope. And I understand like the image I'm showing here is the Esprit 150 on an EQ8. That is high dollar stuff. You don't need anything of that caliber. But they want something that when their clients come in, they're like, wow, a telescope. And it doesn't really have to be anything fancy on our end. Um, Cassegrains, like Schmidt Cassegrains, I think are the best all around telescope to use. Um, if you're just getting started with this, I would probably recommend a C8 to start. Um, so that works really well. It's enough aperture to keep people interested you can see all kinds of stuff you've got focal length to make planets look good the moon looks great and it's easy to lug around a c8 is perfect a c11 is even better because there's a good chance that someone in the crowd somewhere has a c8 at home there's a lot less people that have a c11 so if you're like well what should i invest in i would do a c11 cpc 1100 um, the fork mount scopes work really well the mounts are incorporated, they're easier to lug around, and you've got a really nice aperture to work with things. But I would probably say a C C8 would be my minimum for Cassegrains, although I have had people start their own things doing C6s with like Hyperstar imaging. There's all kinds of stuff you can do with it. Uh, refractors. Uh, refractors, I think you should be a little careful about. Um, I like to do five inch or larger refractors. Um, I use the Esprit 150, which you see here. And then the newest edition is the Stellar View 180, which is kind of the workhorse right now. Uh, those are big refractors. Um, but a five inch refractor is, is big enough to where it looks really interesting. Um, and bigger, just they look like a telescope. They're impressive. You can do a four inch refractor. There's nothing wrong with it. Um, it just is not as impressive to your crowd, even though it could be a Takahashi or an astrophysics or a tech. No one cares. No one knows the brand names like we do. So if you bring out an astrophysics Starfire, wow, that's a really cool telescope. That's literally going to be it. No one cares 
what it is. Last night I had a Stellar View 180 out. There's only 50 of them in the world. No one cared. They just thought it was an amazing telescope and the view was awesome. And then we went into a little bit of the specs about the telescope, but that was it. But you want something that draws people. So a C8, C11, great sizes. A decent size refractor, awesome. Dobsonians are really impressive telescopes. They're odd looking things, but they are big and they are bulky and they are hard to load in. Um, I've done it with a 16 inch Dob. I've done it with a 20 Obsession and now I'm doing it with my 28. That is a delicate balance of what you want to deal with. Um, those are big telescopes to work with, but there's two sides to this. Number one is, God, that's a lot of work. But number two, the way I pitch it is we have a 28 inch telescope in our lineup. If your venue is large enough, we can bring it out. It is the largest mobile telescope for these kind of events in Phoenix or wherever your location is. That's a sales pitch right there. That actually allows you to charge more because your event is more unique than others. There is no other experience. And that's what you have to remember is you are selling an experience to people. So when you're like, we have this and this and this, and this is what it gives you, big sales pitch for you to go in there and be able to kind of command a higher price for you to rake it in. But you have to remember, you're going to be doing all the work. So if you're willing to lug one around, good for you. You just have to remember those logistics. Last night, I had no ability to get the 28 into the location that I needed to, and it wasn't a big enough area to handle it. So the refractor came out. You just need to know your gear. Um, but a lot of friends I work with use C11s, which is a brilliant balance between aperture and focal length and ease of use. So I think the best all around scope for this is C11s. Um, other gear, um, safety lighting, having red accent lighting is very nice to have. Um, wagons and transport gear is a must. Uh, step ladders is a must. Glow tape is very helpful, especially around like the eyepiece or the counterweights or any trip spots. Um, but if the more self-sufficient you are, the better. I don't like messing with anything when I get to an event. I've got batteries. I've got backup controllers. I've got everything. They're like, do you need anything? It's like, nope, we're all set. And the easier you are to work with, the more you'll get business back. Um, as far as mounts go, it doesn't really matter. It all comes down to what you're willing to handle. I use two EQARs. That's because I have them and I have them packed in ways that allow me to get them in and out. Um, the new harmonic mounts that are on the market nowadays would be really nice, but the telescopes I use don't fit on those harmonic mounts. They need bigger ones. Um, but you use whatever mount works for you. You need to be able to get in there, set up, and be ready to go by the time that they want you to start. So whatever allows you to get that done in that time frame, that's the gear that you need to do. Um, let's see, still need to hear about eyepieces and cameras. Uh, okay, I have live imaging equipment. I have a 40 inch um, LED TV we can bring out and I have cameras that we hook up to do live stack imaging, ASI Air, I've used SkyX before. And then I have eyepieces and stuff as well. Um, I have found over the years that as cool as live imaging is, there's a disconnect for people there. The last one I did for live imaging, and I charge them more because live imaging is a pain to do. There's more setup. And I do state that I need power access to run everything. So there's a caveat to that. You need to know your gear. Um, I don't like to do live imaging anymore because I have never found it to be that successful at the end of the day. So many people like the thought of casting an image onto a monitor, but a lot of attendees don't really care because they want that interaction with the telescope. They want to look through it. Now, maybe there's some new gear coming out that would allow for that, but I don't like doing live imaging unless it's a special needs group and that is what you need to have so i still have the gear there 
It doesn't really get used that much, but I have that in the lineup if I need it. Um, so it is an option and I charge more for that option because it's more work. Um, but eyepieces are my general go-to. Um, you can use any kind of eyepieces that you like, whatever works for your telescope. Some people like using cheap eyepieces. I like using high-end eyepieces because I want people to have the best view possible. You're already lugging out all this other stuff and big deal, someone touches it. You get some alcohol, clean it off. It's glass, you're not gonna hurt anything. Um, so I use Televues and I have a set of Pentax XWs as well, which was a bonus last year because we did some good events. So I was able to buy the Pentax XW line and ride it off, yay. And now you have a backup set. So if you're running two telescopes, you've got a nice set here and a nice set there. That's just what works for me. But get some decent eyepieces because you're getting paid. So make it nice. Um, let's see what else is in here. Uh, let me, this is the next thing. So how much? Um, um, you could start doing events for free. Um, that's a good way to get out there and start doing it. And it also builds up your portfolio a bit. Um, maybe be careful about how you go about doing that. Um, but start small, um, give people a taste of what you can do, especially if maybe you're getting like a resort contract. Why don't you be like, before we do this, why don't I come do one event for you for free and you see how we work together. And if you really like it, then we'll sit down and we'll come up with some kind of agreement. So, um, you need to remember that you have value. It is, they're not paying for your gear. They're paying for you. This is your time. This is your organization and planning, your knowledge, your equipment. So when people say, wow, that's a lot of money. It's the same thing when you hire like a musician in a band to come out. It's like, well, I'm not giving you that much money. Well, I had to invest in practice time. I had to invest in studio time to work with my band. I had to buy my instruments. There's a lot of investment on the back end that people never see. So you are getting paid for all of that. So you are worth something. And what is your time worth? You have to dictate that. Um, I will tell you, I'm not telling you my prices. Um, you have to figure your own out. But I would not set foot out for an event for under 500 bucks a night. And that's for one telescope. Because that's a lot of work. You got to, you know, maybe you have to leave early. Um, I have kids. Maybe I have to spend an evening away from them. Like, there are things that come into, you need to, there's a lot of prep and work. And at the end of the day, you have to remember this is a business and you have to keep track of those finances. So every event you do, it's probably good to pull about 20% of what you get paid and put into a savings account because that's taxes. So you need to think about how much you are actually pocketing at the end of the night. And is it worth your time an effort for what you're you're netting, not just the gross amount. So if you do 500, and let's say we pull 20% out for taxes, now you pocketed 400 bucks. Is 400 bucks in your pocket worth the amount of effort that you just put in? So you have to think about that. Um, and it just depends, you need to know your market. And what I found is I went online and I actually looked up how much is a DJ for an event. You'd be surprised how much a basic DJ costs. A DJ for most events costs somewhere between 500 and 1500 or more for the night. So you need to, why are you not getting paid somewhere in that window? Now, I think 1500 for one telescope for an evening is a bit much. But maybe if you're in, I don't know, L.A. or New York or some very large metropolis and you want to be unique, maybe you command a higher price. It just depends on where you're at. But you don't just come in hot being like, oh, it's this much. It's, But you don't want to raise your prices crazy either. Every few years, I'll probably bump mine up if I need to. But all right, now I'm in a good spot. So mine have kind of set up there. Um 
but you'd be surprised people are willing to pay you the money to do it but remember it's your time it's your effort what is that worth to you and you have gas you have food you have planning all of that goes into an event so at the end of the day if you set up like five telescopes and you only netted 300 bucks at the end of the evening maybe that's good enough for you but it just depends on what works for you for me I did an event for my 28 and I lugged that in there. I learned really quick that that needed to go up. So, but you need to kind of figure out what's going to work for you um, and what is worth your time and your effort. And some people might ask before we shut this all down, um, do you do hourly or do you do for the evening? I do for the evening. I don't like doing hourly hourlies just get messy and you have to keep track of the time and event planners like it when it's very clean and easy it's like my rate is this for the evening done and then the way i structure it is so there's my initial fee there's this is how much it is for me the telescope and all the prep work is x amount that is the base fee for my event and then if i have to bring in more telescopes and more astronomers each one of those has an extra rate tacked on to it because I also have to make sure the people helping me are getting a cut for their time and their effort and that we're making that. So you need to kind of fill in what works for you. And if you are bringing people on to assist you, you need to make sure that they are being supported as well because they're there for their time and their effort. So you make a little cut on that and then your buddy gets paid too for their time and their effort. So you kind of have to make sure you know what you're getting yourself into there, but your time and your air, uh, effort. Um, so you go that way. So, um, but all, all this needs to be a uh, part of your pricing. Start small and build up from there, but don't undersell your stuff either. Um, because remember, you, your time is worth something. And it took me a long time to figure out that. I think that's the biggest issue. I know we're running over time right now, but that's the biggest issue. And I think a lot of us don't realize what we're actually worth and what our time is worth. Because when you work for a company, they're just like, oh, hey, we pay you this. This is your salary done. When you're doing your own thing, you get to set your price. But it has to be within that reason um, you also need to know your audience and you need to know your client base and know where you're going to fit in the market so maybe look up a couple if you want to get an idea look up a dj look up a band locally in your area being like how much would it be for me to hire you for the evening start somewhere in there don't be ridiculous you know it's like it's a thousand dollars for me to come out for one night okay no one's gonna pay for that like that gets a little ridiculous but i wouldn't go anywhere below 500 because you need to make some money for yourself there's your time there's your effort there's your gas there's food there's a lot of things that go into this and when you throw insurance into that too you need to make sure let's say you've got two thousand dollars in insurance that you have to pay you need to make two grand or before you are making anything by the end of the day. So, um, or by the end of the year, you need to make sure you're covering that initial $2,000 cost. So you're probably gonna have to do four or five events at $500 a pop before you're ready to go. So, and you're making money because you're already in the red at that point because um, you've spent money. Now we have to pay that off. So every year you gotta make sure um but uh you guys would be happy making 50 bucks and that's fine maybe that works for you and that's totally okay but the problem here is when you're doing it business level you're paying two thousand dollars or so for insurance a year you can either eat that cost and be like that's what it costs me or you can make some money and cover and get that cost back i also use my events to help cover the cost of the insurance and the insurance allows me to do special events where I can volunteer and not have to charge someone. So it's all, 
it's all a balance and a mix so another one in here is like be wary of drunk attendees yeah there are people that get drunk it's kind of rare um i've had it i've never had anybody that's so problematic about it um but you just be aware of it is there telescope insurance you can get valuable property insurance from most places um but yeah if you use a daub use a shroud people will drop and spill things on your mirror a friend of mine actually had someone spill wine on his 28 inch mirror before he doesn't have a shroud for his scope mine does my 28 has a shroud and the mirror is in the box so they do not get close to the mirror um but a lot of times the optics are pretty well protected so i don't worry too much about that sometimes i'll have a little table or something where it's like hey before you go up if you could just put your drink right there or i'll hold the drink for you um and then we'll go from there but yeah all right so unless you guys have any questions about this we ran a little bit over but we started a tad bit late because my audio was being weird but if you have any further questions throw them in the chat real quick um other than that that's it for this episode hopefully that's helpful there's that's just like the base foundation of things um there's obviously a lot more that can go with it if you have any questions um and you want to stop by the neef booth you can always come by and we can talk face to face there if you have any other thoughts or ideas, you can email us at info at skywatchusa.com. Please go ahead and subscribe. Leave a like on a video. It lets us know we're doing a good job. Um, but that's it for private events for profit. Um, so there you go. Um, next week is a pre-recorded episode. We're just going to go over some of our overlooked products, you know, telescopes that we don't, you don't see out in the field that often. Give them some light a bit. Uh, but that will be a pre-recorded episode because we will be at NIAC and NEF next week. So, but if you are going to be at that event, stop by, say hi. Our whole team is going to be there. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you guys. We've got some new products we're really excited to finally release. So uh, go out and check it out, and I'm sure you'll see more about that. Um, but thanks very much, everyone. We'll see you in a couple weeks. Some of you will see next week. And uh, other than that, please have a great week in clear skies and see you guys soon. Bye.